Um, whilst we, um, while we're getting just getting started, um, so a couple of things. Um, firstly, I hope everybody's uh, managing to keep uh, safe and, and well. Um, thank you very much for for taking the time to to join this webinar. Um, as I said, I'll distribute a copy of the slides and a recording afterwards. And if you have any questions um, as we go through, um, please uh, use the question panel in your uh, go to webinar webinar control panel, and um, I'll pick them up at the end. So uh, I'm going to cover. Um, some of the basics of GDPR and data protection and um, the privacy rules and how they fit into marketing um, and look at what might be coming in the future um, due to some um, updated guidance from the Information Commissioner um, and then hopefully there'll be some time for some questions at the end if you if you have any. So okay so um, uh, as I said just a minute ago, my name is Mark Gracie. Um, I run um, a support uh, helpline business for uh, businesses and organisations who need help with uh, data protection compliance. Um, I've been involved in data protection since the uh, 1998 Act came into, into force and uh, when GDPR um, got, uh, was published in 2016, I started talking to businesses about, about that and um, have had a number of businesses um, or aspects of my business um, dealing with uh, GDPR compliance and, and privacy and, and marketing compliance as, as well. So the purpose of this um, webinar is really just to go over some of the basics of um, data protection, um, the privacy rules and marketing. So um, I noticed that some people who have registered um, possibly aren't in the UK. So just to clarify, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the GDPR, which of course applies across the whole of uh, EU, including the UK, um, and is still in place even though we've left Europe um, at the end of the um, Brexit transition period, which is currently supposed to be the end of this year, whether um, coronavirus means we might end up extending that, I don't know. But um, when we come out of the transition period, we will have a UK version of the GDPR. So for all intents and purposes, when I refer to GDPR, it will be the GDPR that's in force right now and in the future will be a UK as well as an EU GDPR going forward. Um, on the privacy side, um, I'll be talking about the PECA rules or the Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulations which is a UK implementation of the privacy directive um, from um, the 2000s where, um, so the privacy um, electronic communications regulations or PECA as I shall refer to it, um, is a 2003 UK regulation and implementation. Different member states will have different implementations of this because um, the difference between GDPR and, and PECA uh, or the privacy directive is, the, is the, really the word regulation and directive. So a regulation, um, applies across the whole of Europe to all member states. Um, a directive has to be implemented into member state law. So um, the reason why I'm making this point is that if you're not UK based, um, some of your national laws will be slightly different um, and there are different rules, particularly when we start talking about what you can and can't do from a privacy point of view. So just wanted to clarify that for anybody who's looking at this from a, um, a different member state or a different part of the world um, aspect. So I'll be talking about this from a UK perspective. OK, so um, probably one of the things that um, I, I'm not sure if it's the case now, but initially people didn't quite realise, and, and I'm always being asked, I, why am I still getting spam email? Because I thought that they, GDPR was going to fix that. Well, the, the reason that you're still getting G, um, spam email, apart from the fact that people, some people are ignoring what the, the, the rules say, um, is that actually GDPR didn't change the rules around um, uh, email marketing or direct marketing um, because uh, GDPR sits alongside the privacy rules. So um, so in the UK, we, marketing compliance is actually made up of two regulations. On the one side, you have data protection, which is the GDPR. And in the UK, we have the Data Protection Act 2018 as well. That sets out the rules around what you can and can't do with, um, uh, with personal data. So any marketing data you have that enables you to identify an individual will be covered by the data protection uh, regulations. And therefore, where um, that those regulations apply, they will apply to your marketing data. So everything that GDPR says will apply to your marketing data in a, in a, in a processing and using that marketing data kind of way. 
However, on the other side, we have, as I said, the PECA rules, which are the UK's implementation of the privacy directive from the EU, which set out the rules for a number of different things. And we'll look, about, uh, look at those um, things in a second. Um, but it's important to realise that these regulations, GDPR and the privacy regulations, sit alongside each other um, and complement each other. And, and where there's an overlap is typically in the use of consent. Um, so in a very summarised um, way, if the PECA rules or the privacy rules say you must have consent, then that consent is as defined in the data protection law, which of course now is GDPR. So uh, that's an important thing and um, to, to realise. Uh, GDPR did not replace the privacy rules, which is why um, people are still able to do B2B marketing and all that kind of thing. And we'll, we'll I'll talk about um, some of those rules in, in, in a second. But let's have a, um, a quick recap of um, the general data protection regulation. Um, I've very I'm given a very over um, you know, sort of top level um, summary here. Um, GDPR is all about the protection of personal data. So that's any data that identifies an individual, either directly or indirectly. Um, so uh, if you have marketing data and, you, uh, for example, a name and an email address for email marketing and you know who that is, um, because the, the name, if you've got the name, then you know who that is, but if you've got a name and an email address, you are processing personal data and therefore data protection applies to that data and what you do with it. Um, there's a set of rules which are called data protection principles, which tell you what you can and can't do with regards to um, sort of a, um, a, a best, a, an approach to processing of data. Um, so uh, all processing has to be fair, lawful and transparent. So um, um, we'll talk about the lawful basis in a minute, which is where the lawfulness comes into it. But the fair and transparency is about everyone shouldn't be surprised to find out that you've got their data and how you're going to be using it. And you have to be very open about how you're going to be using their data. You have to process the data for the specific purpose. You've got it in the first place. You can't use it for other things unless another lawful basis applies. The data you collect has to be relevant. So if you only need a name and an email address, only ask for a name and an email address. Don't ask for the telephone number if you're not going to need, need it either, or the postal address if you don't plan on doing any postal marketing or anything like that. Um, you have to keep the data up to date. So if you get told something about the personal data you have about an individual has changed, then you've got a duty to um, update your records and also tell anybody that you might have shared that data with. You should only keep data for as long as it's lawful for you to do so. And that, that retention may vary depending on the circumstances by which you've got the data in the first place. Obviously, while you're processing the data for a customer as part of a contract, then you would be keeping that data for the length of the contract and then looking at what other options happen after the customer has left, left your service. All processing has to be done securely. Um, so that means you have to think about um, making sure that you have organizational and technological measures in place to protect personal data at all times. And that includes your, your marketing data as well. Um, and the GDPR introduced a new principle called the accountability principle, which in essence says it's not good enough that you think you're doing the right thing. You've actually got to prove it. Um, and there's uh, various bits of the accountability principle that crop up um, um, in, across the whole of the GDPR. And, and I'll talk about accountability in a bit more detail in a second. Um, there's also some rules about where data is processed and you're not supposed to process data outside the um, EEA. Um, if you do, then you've got to make sure that there's some checks and balances in place to ensure that the data will be um, protected. Um, so, as I said, I'm not going to go into too much detail on all these things. You're just going to sort of take around a, a, a quick whip round this, this um, chart and, uh, and run off the, the key things. So, moving on to the lawful basis, um, you must, when you're processing data, there must be a lawful basis for the processing. Uh, if you can't identify one, then you shouldn't be doing the processing. Um, and it's important that you choose the right lawful basis for the reason for which you're doing the processing. But it is possible that in different circumstances, you might have different lawful bases, depending on what you're processing the data for. Of course, the, the, probably the most well-known lawful basis and, and something that has led to um, this confusion about consent and whether you do or don't need it for marketing purposes is this lawful basis of consent. So GDPR sets out that um, consent has to be um, you have to be open and transparent about why it is you want somebody to consent and they have to give a 
um, positive action to actually give you that that consent. So that's done away in certainly in marketing terms, the uh, pre-ticked box or the the tricky or woolly wording that you're not sure you're going to have to read a paragraph to try and work out whether you wanted to tick or untick the box. Um, it's you've got to be um, very open and clear. But the individual has to take a, a basically um, a decision based on what you've explained to them that is going to happen to their data, um, and they have to take a positive action clicking a confirmation button, ticking a box or, or whatever that might be to actually give you that consent. And where the accountability principle comes in is that you also have to document that consent. So we're going to be talking about consent quite a bit because it fits in with, with what we're, the topic we're talking about, direct marketing and where the privacy rules uh, refer to consent. But um, I just the just last thing on consent, the important thing to bear, bear in mind is that it is very binary. It's a yes or a no. If you're asking for consent and somebody says no, that's it. You can't do anything um, about that, um, whether you think it's in for their benefit or not. Um, and it also means that uh, there isn't a right for somebody, an absolute right for somebody to withdraw that consent. So they can say yes today and they can say no tomorrow and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's quite an important thing when we look at uh, consent in, in marketing because of unsubscribes and and the right for somebody to tell you that they don't want to get your marketing anymore, for example. But there are other lawful bases for processing, and it's, as I said before, it's important to choose the right one. If you're processing data as part of a contract or entering into a contract, so you're providing a service to somebody and the data you need is as part of that service, be it the billing for them for, for your time or your services or your products or the delivery of a product or, or, or whatever it might be that you're, you're, um, you're doing or the reason why you got the data in the first place, then it's likely your lawful basis is going to be contract. You don't need you don't need to ask for um, you, you wouldn't need to go through a process of saying, please give us your address details so that we can post the item to you. Can you consent for us to put it on the outside of the envelope because the postman might see it and all, all of these kind of things. That's all within the context of contract and, and the reasons um, why you've got the data in the first place. You may be obliged by law to um, maintain um, um the the data um so uh for example um we have to keep tax records for the purposes of satisfying our um hmrc um and providing evidence if, if ever queried as part of an investigation so you would have a legal obligation to keep certain amount of information for um six years plus the current year to meet those requirements for example you may be in a regulated sector that the, the regulator requires you to keep certain uh bits of data for um, longer than you need it and to meet a, a legal obligation, for example, if you're in education or in, in health um, type services. Um, vital interest as a lawful basis is a life and death scenario. So that basically means that if it's in the life or death, if it's a life or death situation and in vital um, that you share data or process the data for the purposes of saving the data subjects, then um, you would be using vital interest as the lawful basis for processing. If you're a public body or you're carrying out duties on behalf of a public body, um, typically public bodies can be identified as those who are answerable to freedom of information um, inquiries um, uh, uh, in, in the UK, um, but things like governments, councils, um, schools, uh, colleges, universities, that kind of thing. If you're um, a public body or you perform duties on behalf of a public body, then public task may well be your lawful basis for processing. Um, and then finally, and this fits into the marketing as well, um, and it's probably um, a, a, another well-known one, and on paper looks like the, um, the, the saviour of you having to think too hard about which is your lawful basis, um, is legitimate interest. Because if you can show it is of your, in, in, in your interest to process data, um, then um, you could claim you have a legitimate interest. But it's not as simple as that. You have to have a clear um, need for the processing. You have to be able to demonstrate that need. Um, you need to be able to demonstrate that there isn't another way you could achieve your aims without processing the data. And um, more importantly, you have to be able to show and demonstrate, so that's the accountability principle of work, that you have um, considered the rights and freedoms of the individual whose data it is, and that, that as long as it's not harmful to them. So um, there's a, a test called a legitimate interest assessment, which you can use to assess whether um, a legitimate interest is actually um, appropriate for you to, to use um, and it does fit into some of the 
uh, marketing type scenarios. For example, GDPR does make a reference that in some circumstances, um, marketing activity might be considered a, le a legitimate interest. Um, and when we talk about um, privacy regulations, um, it fits within um, the, uh, the, the requirements for, um, uh, for example, um, for the, the soft opt-in option when you're marketing to customers. So that's the lawful basis. Um, moving around to individuals rights. So these are the rights of the data subject and in the marketing uh, area, probably the, the key ones to consider. Um, again, as I said, GDPR applies to all your marketing data as it would any other data that you're processing. So things like subject access, right? The request for somebody to say, uh, sorry, the right for somebody to request a copy of their data and um, and ask how you're using it and and and, and provide them with, um, receive a copy of it um, is, is as relevant to your um, marketing data as is as any other data that you're processing um, but the probably one of the key ones to consider is the right to be informed so that's the fairness and transparency aspect of, of the the principles of, of, of um, data protection which is that somebody has to understand how you're going to be using their data and what you're going to be doing with it how long you're going to keep it what their rights are and, and, and so on and that's the thing that leads or this right is the thing that leads to us having privacy policies or statements that set out exactly what it is that um, you're going to be using the data for and how they can get in touch with you if they want to ask questions or want to complain and, and, and so forth. Um, there is also a right to object um, to processing and, and that right gives somebody the absolute right to object to marketing information, so basically unsubscribing or, or withdrawing the consent that they may have given you pre previously. Um, so, but there's a range of different rights, as I say, ranging to, you know, right, right to erasure or the right to be forgotten was quite well documented when GDPR um, was first published because it was a, a new right that enables somebody to request that their data is deleted, um, for example. But there's a, a, a number of different ones and um, probably the only other one to, to mention is the rights about automated decision making and profiling. Now, I'm not going to go into this in, in, in any detail today, but... Um, there are some considerations around that if you are using certain technologies um, to profile individuals and um, maybe make decisions about what marketing you might be sending to them. Um, and then finally on that slide, I just wanted to highlight accountability because it's a very important aspect of GDPR and, and was a new angle to, to GDPR and data protection across Europe. And, and it's the accountability principle that requires you to have um, documentary evidence of what data you're processing and, and how you're processing it and why it's lawful to do so, et cetera. It's the requirement for you to have policies and training in place so that your, your employees understand the basics of data protection and, and therefore can relate to how that applies to their, their um, everyday duties. Um, in, in the marketing world, there's there's a few different things there that we'll talk about a bit uh, in a bit. Um, so things like data protection impact assessment, so it's basically a risk assessment to enable you to identify risks from a processing and uh, mitigate those risks. Um, processor due diligence and contracts. If you're using a third party um, uh, who's doing some processing for you, and, and it's important to understand a very wide definition of processing includes the storage and the sharing of data as much as the reason why you got it in the first place, um, then you have to make sure that that processor is GDPR compliant and you put in place a contract with that individual uh, processor so that um, they, they are bound by a set of rules which are dictated in Article 28 of the GDPR um, and those are the kind of things that you've probably seen in data processing agreements. Now, where this fits into um, marketing is, is very much depending on how you, what tools you're using for marketing. So, you know, using as an example, MailChimp, if you're using MailChimp to send um, emails, then they are a third party processor because um, they will be sending out emails on your behalf and you'll be storing your emails in, in, a, in a, an email list within in the MailChimp system. So they would be a data processor in, in that example. So that was a very quick summary of, of GDPR. Let's move on to the privacy regulations. So as I said, in the UK, we've got the Privacy Electronic Communication Regulations of 2003. They um, cover a number of different things. The, the light blue stuff on the right, I'm not gonna really uh, talk about because um, they set out some rules around telecom services and, and the use of location data and things like that. But in a marketing sense, the two key things are um, rules around direct marketing, when you do and don't need consent for different types of marketing. 
um, and uh, rules around uh, uh, use of cookies or other similar technologies like um, pixels, tracking beacons and, um, and, and whatever anybody else calls them, um, sort of various different systems that use different names. Um, but any, anything that enables you to track an individual or, or store information in a, in a cookie about an individual or an individual's behavior um, is covered by um, the cookie rules and we'll talk about those in a second. So these are the two areas I'm going to focus on and um, let's start about uh, talking about the electronic marketing rules. So um, the privacy rules talk about electronic marketing and um, I've summarized in this slide essentially um, what those rules mean to what you might be doing with your direct marketing depending on so number and one and two are, are about phone calls number three four and five are about um, messaging which includes emails texts so sms texts or even messaging through um, online services and then i've got snail mail at the bottom which if anybody's not familiar with the term snail is basically uh, traditional postal services so i'm not going to um, dwell too much on the uh, phone call stuff and, and won't talk about snail mail. Um, you can read those sections for yourself. Um, as I say, I'll supply a copy of the slide so you'll get to see um, see those. Um, but there are specific rules about what you should and shouldn't be doing with regards to opting in and opting out and whether you can call people and, and not call people and whether they're live calls, which means it's somebody, uh, a human talking to somebody as opposed to a pre-recorded call or an automated call that might be on an automated dialer. You've, I'm sure you've had these electronic messages uh, coming through and um, you, you think you're answering the phone and uh, it turns out to be a, a computer talking to you about, um, well, I don't know, problems with your windows or uh, um, some problem, some trick thing to uh, try and get you to hand over details of your bank account or uh, your uh, Amazon um, account details or that kind of thing. So I'm going to focus just on three, four and five um, uh, um, today. Um, and the key thing there is that the rules around what you need to do will depend on whether you're dealing with consumers or businesses, whether you're dealing with, um, or sorry, and or whether you're dealing with customers. So in all instances, as I've said already, the GDPR will apply to the data that you're processing for the purposes of your direct marketing, regardless of the means. So if you have an email address, and you have a, a text number or you have a, a, an ID on a, a social media channel and you are able to identify an individual and you're targeting your message messages to those people through those channels, the data that you have, regardless of where you're processing that data, will apply, uh, GDPR will apply. Now, simply put, if you're dealing with consumers or individual citizens or you're dealing with sole traders, you must have consent um, before you can do anything um, to do any of the marketing messages. And that consent has to be GDPR level of consent. There is an exemption, which is that if you're, uh, if you're dealing with a customer, so somebody that's taken a service from you, then um, you can rely on what's called the soft opt-in. And this is where the legitimate interest came in before. So soft opt-in basically says that if you give your customer during the sign up journey or the customer journey, whatever you want to call it, the opportunity to say they didn't want your marketing um, and they didn't say they didn't want it, then you can market to them until they tell you otherwise. But in all instances, you have to provide the option for somebody to opt out and, and therefore withdraw that consent um, and you have to honor that. So if somebody says no, then that's it, you can't market to them ever again. So you'll need systems in place to make sure that you are able to, to process and manage that. So to summarize, if you're dealing with consumers or sole traders, then you must have consent before you can market to them. You can't email them or contact them to ask them for consent because that is construed as considered marketing. So you would be in breach of the rules. And um, so you have to rely on inbound marketing as, um, practices, essentially. So they come to you and sign up to mailing lists and all, all that kind of thing. Or, um, you know, they, or they come to you through some other um, form of um, media that you might be using. Um, the exception to that is if you have asked the, the individual who is a customer whether they want to receive marketing and they've, said, they've not said no, um, in which case you can market to them. If you're dealing with businesses apart from sole traders, as I mentioned just a minute ago, then you don't need consent. So you can, if you wish, find 
the name of a direct um, a director from a business off of their website or on LinkedIn or on social media and send targeted messages to that individual in their position as a, an employee of a business. Now, you don't need consent for doing that, but a lot of people think you do need consent for everything and therefore um, don't be surprised if you do do it that some people might say to you, how are you doing this? You're not supposed to be doing it. I never gave you consent and you would have to explain the reasons that you know these rules do actually tell you that you don't need consent. Um, but you should also make sure that what you're marketing to them is relevant to their role. So if you want to scrape data off of the internet to do a marketing campaign to a number of people within business, within their roles as an employee, you can do so and you don't need consent. But just like the previous options, um, GDPR rules apply to the data and how you're processing it. Um, and um, you have to provide an honor opt out. And again, if a business uh, individual says they don't want to receive your um, details as uh, your marketing information, um, they're opting out and you must stop marketing to them. And then just finally, if you're emailing generic email addresses, so info at, hello at, sales at, accounts at, or, or whatever it might be, you're not processing personal data and therefore GDPR doesn't apply, but the privacy rules again do come in and whilst you don't need consent, um, a business or an organization or anybody, whether they're anonymous or or um, you get to get to know their names, can have the, the option to opt out on behalf of the business or indeed through that, that um, contact address. So that's a quick quick summary. Um, I've got a poster on my website, markgracygdpr.co.uk, um, which you can download. Uh, it's a free resource which you can just uh, download. It's a, a sort of graphical representation of, of, of this. Um, so let's move on. Um, cookies, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. Um, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, the regulator, published some updated guidance last summer, um, which essentially says if you're using cookies that you need for the functioning of the website, so for example, remembering what's put into an e-commerce basket or remembering somebody has been able to log in and you don't have to they don't have to log in every time they visit your web page if they want to remember, you know, retain a, a login credential. Um, then you don't need consent for those essential cookies. If you are using any other cookies, then the regulations or the, the guidance says you must have consent and that, that covers all non-essential cookies. So that means your Google Analytics, your um, uh, any kind of social media plugins you might have and, and be using um, and any kind of tracking pixels and things that you might be using as well. But it's quite helpful to actually break non-essential cookies down into two pots. So there's non-essential cookies that are not privacy intrusive. For example, Google Analytics, a typical Google Analytics free account doesn't give you information about the individual. Um, it just tells you that there was somebody who looked at your website and this is what they did and you know and how many people accessed it and all that kind of thing. And there's privacy intrusive non-essential cookies, which will be ones that either retain information about an individual, so you're processing personal data, or is enabling you to um, track or, or record or manage behaviors of an individual. So those will be cookies that enable somebody to see uh, visit a website and then go to another page that uses, say, an Amazon or a Google ad, and you, you suddenly see your advert appear in in that if you're using um, some of the ad tech functionality that uh, some providers provide. Um, it also includes um, uh, any cookies or pixels that you might use which enable you to identify or, or track somebody. So for example, um, HubSpot has the functionality that if somebody fills out a contact form on your website, that then matches an individual to any interaction on social media, your CRM and all these kind of things. So you can build this picture or profile up about the person. Now, the reason why I say you it's worth sort of breaking these down into two pots is that whilst the ICO has said all non-essential cookies require consent and you need controls, um, so there's specific things you need to do. You need to have a policy, and um, whether that's in your privacy policy or a separate cookie policy that explains you use cookies and what ones you use. You also have to have a pop-up banner that says that you're using cookies and, and give the person the op opportunity to... Um, uh, opt in or out of, of the cookies. Now, in non-essential cookie terms, whilst the ICO has said that the non-privacy intrusive cookies like Google Analytics require consent, they do say right at the end, when it comes to enforcing, they're probably not going to take action. 
but they'd never guarantee that they wouldn't, but they probably wouldn't take action against non-intrusive cookies, but they will um, take action for sure if you're mis misusing um, privacy intrusive cookies. So what that means is you need to look at what cookies you're using. And if you're using privacy intrusive cookies, you need to make sure you have cookie controls available to users when they use your website. Um, and you uh, must get consent before, and that's GDPR level consent, before you can start using the cookie or the pixel. Um, if you're using non-privacy intrusive cookies, so if you're just using Google Analytics, strictly speaking, you should get consent before you use it. But you, it's up to you how you sit with a risk, um, um, your risk profile as to whether you want to take the risk of not being called up by the ICO to find out why you're not asking consent for those cookies. But um, the uh, guidance hints that um, they probably wouldn't take any action um, if uh, that's the only infringement that they're dealing with for you. So that's very briefly um, cookies. Um, and uh, as I say, where cookies require you, or the cookie regulations require you to have consent, that has to be GDPR level consent. So um, moving on, what, what does compliance look, compliance look like? Well, you know, in all honesty, it's much more than just consent. Yes, when privacy regulations, whether that's direct marketing or cookies, say you need consent, you must now apply the GDPR level of consent. So you have to provide information about what that consent, why you need that consent and what that person will be consenting to. And you have to get a positive action um, from them to give you that consent. And you have to be able to demonstrate that you were given it as well. So you have to have a record of that. You need to make sure you're clear what your lawful basis for processing is. Um, so you might, for example, either just rely on consent, in which case you need to have that documented that when somebody does this, you are asking for consent and you're able to demonstrate you've got that consent. And you might be relying on legitimate interest, particularly if you're relying on market, direct marketing to customers who haven't opted out. And that would be a legitimate interest. Um, and the ISO have also indicated that if you are maintaining a list of unsubscribers so that you don't accidentally add them again um, to your list or you don't um, accidentally send them marketing messages, so um, maintaining an unsubscribe list as well as who is subscribed to your email list, um, as an example, then um, you have a legal obligation to make sure you don't um, send marketing material to people who have opted out. So you will probably rely on legal obligation as the lawful basis for processing in that scenario. Understand your cookie rules and what you should and shouldn't do, as I, we just covered. Um, if you're doing new marketing activity or you're unsure whether you are compliant at the moment, then um, data protection impact assessments is a really useful tool. And whilst GDPR talks about doing a DPIA only when there's a risk to the individual, the ICO in the UK specifically say you should really do it whenever you're doing something different, like whether that's a new system, a new set of data, a new process or, or, or whatever. So it's always useful to have that to hand because it makes you think about what some of the risks could be and more importantly, how you're going to mitigate those risks. But it also gives you a documentary platform to be able to demonstrate that you thought it through and, and um, you know, you, you thought about data protection and made sure that um, it's, uh, it's, um, you've done all the right things. Um, so that meets one of the elements of the accountability principle. Um, and there's a template on the Information Commissioner's website you can download and use to carry out a, a data protection impact assessment. Don't forget the rights and freedoms of the individuals who you're processing. So they have um, uh, they have the right to be informed and they are entitled to the other rights as well. So if you have a, an email marketing uh, database and somebody on that list wants you to provide copies of the information that you've got about them, how you got it and, and what you're doing with it, that is a subject access request and it doesn't matter that you've only got them on your email list and nowhere else in your system you would have to explain all of that as part of the subject access right and there's time limits and other requirements you need to uh, adhere to as well if you're doing profiling and that might be um, using some of those pixels we were talking about before then you've got to consider the implications of of profiling individual as well and if you do lots of profiling and monitoring of people's activities then you might even need to have a data protection officer um, taking responsibility for, for that and the GDPR dictates what that data protection officer's role should should look like. If you're doing social media marketing and making use of um, uh, look-alike audiences or, or even targeting audiences then there's some rules you'll need to think about in terms of what that might look like. Um, you know, does the individual expect you to be able to use their email address to target them on Facebook or, or um, via LinkedIn or, or something like that? 
And if you're using third party systems to do some of your marketing activities like MailChimp or .mailer or, 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 or whatever system, if you're using it through a CRM or, um, or some other online system, you are likely to be using them as a third party processor. So that means you have to carry out due diligence and make sure that they are processing data according to GDPR levels. Um, you, and and um, you also need to make sure that there's a data processing agreement in place. If they don't have one, you need to make sure you put yours um, in place as well. And obviously the reverse, if you're a, a processor doing the, the work for somebody, then you would want to look at it from your, your side of, of, of the fence, as it were. Um, and the other thing to consider is a lot of these online systems are not based in Europe and therefore processing data outside of Europe is not allowed unless some checks and balances are in place. So you will also need to understand where they process your data and whether any of these checks and balances like the Privacy Shield, which is an EU US agreement and whether that uh, applies. So there's quite a lot that you need to think about. And um, uh, a lot of this is um, actually more around GDPR. And whilst the, the PECA rules are very clear about direct marketing, the GDPR rules actually account for a lot of the other side of things for you to, to consider. Um, and this is going to become more and more important, not because the law has changed at all, but because there's been more clarification or there's clarification coming. So um, I ran a, a webinar about this uh, a few months back now. Um, uh, well, I can't remember actually earlier this year or maybe the end of last um, about an, an update to the direct marketing code of practice. So this is the Information Commissioner's Office direct marketing code of practice, which um, sets out basically um, guidance, which isn't bound in law in the sense that it's a criminal offence if you don't um, follow the guidance, but it's a, another tool which you would have to demonstrate why you didn't follow it as best practice um, uh, if, if anything went wrong. But this code of practice sets out some of the rules. Now, there is a direct marketing code of practice at the moment, and it, it talks a lot about the, the privacy of PECA rules. Um, but this new draft that um, the consultation ended in, in March, and it's difficult to know what's going to happen going forward with, with um, the coronavirus pandemic and where the RCA might be focusing some of their efforts in terms of, of compliance activity um, to know when this might happen. But I would suggest if you've not looked at it, have a look at it. You'll probably find on my website a blog post about uh, sort of summarising some of the key things. But the thing about this draft code is it's updated for a GDPR world. So it talks a lot about some of those things I was talking about. Um, and there's some very key things in there. If you're doing lead generation work about, well, if you're collecting information about individuals that don't know you have their data for marketing purposes, because you're going to be doing lead generation, then the rights to be informed comes into play. Um, and the right to be informed when it comes to data that you've collected not from the individual directly requires you within a month to tell them you have their data and what you're going to do with it so if you're collecting data on behalf of clients if you're a, a lead generation business for example and you're you're um, finding contacts um, that they might want you to market to on their behalf then you need to provide them with a privacy notice that explains that you have their data and how you're going to be using it for example um, it also sets out some other things around the stuff i mentioned there, like facebook audience profiling um, and the use of technology as well. So if you haven't had a look at the draft code, um, it's worth having a look at that because um, that will give you an insight into where the information commissioner um, is thinking with regards to enforcement of uh, or expected behaviours according to GDPR in relation to the privacy rules as well. Um, as I say, the, the process is they've consulted on a draft it could change. People may have been able to convince them that some of it's not right. But even so, at this stage, um, I think it's a, a good heads up about what you should be doing if you're not doing it all already. And, uh, you know, in my mind, a lot of what they're saying you sh we should be doing anyway, because it's just the interpretation of the law and documented in, in plain English so that we can all understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing. So it's not introducing anything new. It's, in it's clarifying a lot of things that I've certainly been telling clients for for a long time about things like right to be informed for lead generation and all these kinds of things. Um, but strictly speaking, they'll review any feedback they've had. Um, it will then have to go to Parliament to be signed off. Now, obviously, Parliament's very distracted with, um, with coronavirus at the moment, and, and no doubt Brexit's probably keeping them busy as well. Um, so um, whether this will happen this year or next year is, is really difficult to, to, to say. 
So I'm conscious of the time, we've got about 15 minutes left. So that was really the sort of last slide I wanted to go through. I just quickly wanted to just um, reiterate where I can come in and help you if you, you need any assistance. So I run a helpline service. At the one end of it is some online resources, which you can um, have access to, and um, it's got templates and things like that. So if you need a privacy policy template, for example, then you can um, get access to that. Um, my key product is the GDPR helpline, which is unlimited email and phone support, as well as the online resources, and you get alerts and updates, so you can keep up to date with what's going on. And then at the other end is um, a DPO service, so that's me providing unlimited email and phone support, the online resources, but also hands-on help, which can be um, uh, four or more hours a month doing things for you, so carrying out reviews, training staff, writing reports, uh, dealing with the information commissioner or, or whatever. Um, or I can do it as you as you need it and pay as you go. And some some clients just have an agreement with me that um, they'll only ask me questions if they need it, and, and I'll charge them according to my uh, pay as you go and um, by the hour um, rate. So have a look at markgracegdpr.co.uk if you want to know a bit more about that. If you want to get in touch and have a a one to one and a conversation about it, or or indeed a a quick conversation about anything we discussed today, then more than happy for you to uh, get in touch. So um, I hope that was useful. Um, I'm going to now have a look and see whether we've got any questions. Um, and if so, um, I'll attempt to answer those. Um, but uh, just to remember, um, there is uh, a questions panel in your go to webinar control panel. Uh, type your question in there and I'll, I'll pick it up. So I'm just going to have a quick scan to see what we've got. Gosh, there's a few questions there. Hang on a second. Okay, so. Um, a question here to, to clarify, is consent different for B2B as opposed to B2C communications? So, so yes, this goes back to, to what I was saying before. So this was the slide um, here where the different rules vary. And, um, and the quick answer is yes, they do vary. So in a very simplistic world, B2C requires consent, B2B doesn't. Um, there's a slight nuance in that sole traders and some small types of partnerships are treated like consumers so so yes there is a, a difference between b2b and b2c comms um okay interesting question from from gina will draft code remove the use of legitimate interest for direct marketing um no um it's not changing what the, the regulations say um it's clarifying when it believes, or the information commissioner believes, and sorry, not um, if, it's clarifying what the information commissioner believes is the more likely lawful basis. Now, in true ICO style, they're not going straight to the point and saying you will need to rely on this lawful basis, but they are saying things like you'll probably find that it would be inappropriate to rely on legitimate interest or consent is unlikely to be relevant in this place, but you may need to assess that yourself. So. Um, whilst it is a code of practice and it does go some of the way, currently in the draft, the wording could be construed as slightly woolly, but it's not getting rid of what can be used. It is ultimately up to you to decide which is the most appropriate lawful basis for processing. And if it comes to the crunch, you would have to demonstrate why you did things the way you did. And if you're relying on legitimate interest, you would have to demonstrate why you believe legitimate interest is, is the right lawful basis. But what the code does do is perhaps steer you in the right direction for what your um, most appropriate lawful basis should be. Thank you for that question. That was a good one. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, right, OK. Uh, sorry, this is quite a long question. Um, spare me a second. Stick that. Oh, I've just ended the presentation. That doesn't work too well, does it? Um, right, anyway, sorry. Um, just put that back. There we go. Sorry, right, okay. Um, OK, so this is a, a question relating to insurance. Um, so thank you for this, Sue. Um, so the question is, if, if a quote is provided 
through an aggregator site for, um, but as they said, motor insurance, but the same would be true for any kind of insurance, but the quote's not accepted, is it okay for the insurance provider to retain the data for the purposes of providing a quote the following year and up to any other further years? Um, and would they have to tell the customer through the aggregator that they retain data for this purpose? So this is, yeah, this is not really that straightforward. Um, it will depend on a lot of the circumstances, but ultimately it will depend on the expectation of the individual as to what's happening to their data. So if an individual provides data for the purposes of an assessment through an aggregator service, they may only expect that that aggregator service will be the one processing their data. If the data is passed to a third party like the insurance uh, company to provide a quote, um, then it's up to the aggregator site or service to provide the information that that's what happens as, as the use of the service. Um, and it would be lawful for them to, to do that, obviously, because that, um, you're providing a quote. If you, um, in those kind of circumstances, I would say that it would be lawful for you to have the data to provide the quote, and it would be lawful for you to retain the data for the purposes of following up about that quote. But unless you specifically asked that they might want to um, hear from you in the future, given the context of what people use aggregators for in terms of finding the, the best opportunity, then I'd say they probably, unless they've been asked to confirm it, i.e. through a, some form of consent, probably would be surprised to hear not from the aggregator, but from an insurance company directly. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I've completely answered your question there, Sue, but, um, you know, feel free to ping me an email and I'll, I'll um, can elaborate a bit further if that's, uh, that's helpful. Okay, so that looks like, I'll just have a quick scan, but it looks like all the questions so far um, that have come through. If you've got anything else that you think of, then um, please ask them now, otherwise we'll end the, end the presentation at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, if you, if you find that um, you had a question or you didn't want to ask it in a, in a Sort of semi-public forum, um, um, then um, yeah, ping me an email, um, hello at markgracygpr.co.uk, and I'll, I'll endeavour to uh, to uh, um, help you um, with that. Um, otherwise, if you if you've got something that you'd like to discuss in a very specific detail, then I'm happy to to set up a um, a one-to-one -one session and um, on a sort of pay-as-you-go basis uh, as as needed, or have a a, big, a wider conversation as well. Okay, so that looks like all of the questions. As I said, I've been recording the session, so I'll send out a link to um, the recording so that you can uh, entertain yourselves um, on lockdown, um, learning even more about uh, GDPR and the exciting world of privacy and marketing compliance. Um, and I'll send around the slides as well. And uh, yeah, you've then got that um, sort of brief summary of um, where GDPR and PECA um, meet and also the uh, quick guide to what you can and can't do for, for marketing rules. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your week. Um, keep safe and uh, hopefully see you on a, on a webinar or some kind of online session uh, in the future. I'm, I'm planning some more, more detailed training programs uh, in, the, in the near, probably um, starting in May. Um, so I'll let you know about those if, uh, if they become relevant from a marketing point of view. Um, and um, if you go to my website and look up the Article 13 Club from the menu, I've got a, a sort of data protection practitioners um, community I'm building up um, and we meet uh, online via Zoom, Zoom um, on the, I think it's the first Tuesday of each month. So we've got um, that coming up on the, uh, whatever the first Tuesday of May is, um, and we'll be covering actually uh, data protection consent and um, uh, the title of the session will be consent or not to consent and um, I'm going to have a marketing person just sort of setting out some of the key aspects of um, what marketing might look un lot like under the current situation that we're in um, and uh, also um, um, some other um, uh, another guest speaker hopefully um, that will uh, uh, be relevant to the conversation that we've, we'll be having as well so if that's of interest um, it's, it's free to, to join, um, it's just uh, 
um, and our Zoom on, uh, as I say, the first Tuesday of the month, have a go to markgracygdpr.co.uk and there's an article 13 link in the menu and you can see the different things there that's signing up to my newsletter and, and as well as this uh, on, online discussion group. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, take care, keep safe and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.